Hi, Zach Smith here with Fiorentino Paranker. Today we're going to find out whether or not drugs can aid in MOB recovery. So if someone accidentally falls overboard, can we place them inside a drug and then safely haul them back on board? Additionally, we're going to try out this uh, homemade block and tackle system. It encompasses the use of a single block with cam, and then we place 80 feet of road over that block, and on each end of the road there'll be a clip sewn to it. So one end of the road will be attached to the victim in the water. The opposite end is attached to a drogue or power anchor. The drogue or power anchor is then dropped into the water and we motor forward slowly in hopes of generating enough force to, to pull that person back on board and hopefully in a safe manner. So we're going to try to do our test inside the breakwater assuming there's not a lot of boat traffic all in an effort to, to stabilize the boat itself. So if I get entangled with a drogue or road or something like that, it'll be a lot easier to deal with that uh, type of situation versus having a boat bouncing all over the place. So let's go ahead and head out into the bay and see how this equipment performs. This was the start of our man overboard recovery test just outside of Los Angeles Harbor. Our pointer, Duke, is making sure we don't lose track of the person in the water, a very important job. And now Bob, my longtime research assistant, is tossing a lifeline into the water and then returns to the helm so he can immediately turn the boat around. The faster we can turn the boat, the faster we can provide a lifeline to the person who's in the water. Obviously, we want to connect the person to the boat quickly so we don't lose them. The line we're towing behind the boat is an 80-foot glow-in-the-dark line. Glow-in-the-dark line is really nice for nighttime recovery. I designed a similar item for NASA's Paranka Recovery System, all in an effort to improve crew recovery in a variety of conditions. At both ends of the 80-foot glow line are stainless hooks. The hook dragging in the water is what I'll use to snap onto the D-rings located on my inflatable vest. Most inflatable vests, or harnesses, have D-rings. If not, you will need to use a purpose-built flotation device like a life sling, something easy to slide over your body. Since I already had D-ring attachment points on my vest, I chose to use a regular floating jacket at the end of our lifeline to make it easier to find the snap hook. As I grab the lifeline, the boat is placed into neutral in order to maintain station. In wind conditions, you would need to use engine power to stay at one location. With Bob receiving the thumbs up that I'm attached to the lifeline, Bob deploys a Fiorentino pair anchor connected to the opposite end of the 80-foot line already attached to my vest. As the pair anchor sinks, it immediately opens up and starts to pull the victim back toward the boat. You then rush to the helm in order to motor forward at approximately a knot or knot and a half. The combined efforts of the pair anchor and boat generate force to pull the victim back to the boat. The trick is not to motor too fast or the victim tends to be pulled underwater. As a conscious victim, you may find yourself using your arms and legs to position yourself in the water so you can face the boat as you approach it. Facing the boat gives you a chance to prevent your body from slamming up against the boat's hull. It also makes it easier to voice instruction to the helmsperson, like bump up the boat speed so you can be pulled out of the water faster, or stop because the end of the line you're attached to is now pressed up against the block. When the victim is back on board the boat, then it's time to slacken the lifeline by slowing the boat with a couple of reverse bursts. I like the concept of using a block and tackle system to lift people from the water, mostly because it requires very little physical strength to pull the victim back on board, especially since the pair anchor and boat are the real muscle lifting all the heavy weight. The boom drogue system does require some thoughtful setup. It took us three runs to figure out the best location for positioning the boom. On our first attempt, the boom was too close to the boat, pulling me toward the boat's quarter and uncomfortably close to the boat's propeller. This is why I chose to climb up under the sugar scoop to avoid slipping under the boat. Our boom positioned itself too far away from the boat's deck during our second trial, leaving me dangling in a rather uncomfortable position. I felt stuck and unable to do much of anything. Part of the challenge is the boom bang usually requires the use of nylon or dacon rope that stretches. A sailor's body weight increases rope stretch, which can alter the position of the boom, especially as the victim exits the water. To help keep the boom somewhat stationary, we did use a preventer line to reduce boom motion. However, like the boom bang, preventer lines are usually made from stretchy nylon or dacron. 
You might have to consider using a Dyneema Dacron blended rope to reduce overall elasticity in the system. Once you figure out the correct placement of your boom for MOB recovery, it's a good idea to use a black felt pen to mark a stopping point on the preventer line. This can reduce the time it takes to position the boom and deploy equipment properly. There is a purpose-built block and tackle available in Europe called Catch and Lift. The system can be attached to your boom, but they also offer shroud clamps where the block with cam cleat can be quickly connected to the stainless cables. This setup does make it much easier to bring the victim on board your boat versus the boom drogue method. Unfortunately, the cable clamp causes loading to be spread over a very small portion of the shroud cable, which can cause unnecessary torque, leading to stress fractures in the stainless cables. Additionally, any kind of permanent cover placed over stainless steel can cause metal fatigue. Travel plans, how often you replace equipment, or sail for that matter, are things to consider when deciding whether metal fatigue is something to be concerned about or not. One more thing I wanted to mention is the bag covering the small parachute included with the catch and lift setup is designed for one-time use only. The parachute itself is reusable. Some thoughts to keep in mind if you consider using a block and tackle MOB recovery system. A couple of times when I grabbed the lifeline, the boat was traveling too fast and I was towed through the water. It took some strength to hold on to avoid having the lifeline yank out of my hands. As a sailor is lifted from the water, be prepared to quickly stop the boat so the victim doesn't slam into the block connected to the boom. As a conscious victim, you want to make sure your fingers don't get caught up in the block as you approach the boom. Easy to do since our natural tendency is to hold on to the lifeline attached to our flotation device. A third thing to remember is to place the pair anchor on the cam cleat side of the block. The cam cleat is the break to prevent the line on the opposite side of the single block from slipping backwards. This is the side the victim is attached to. Cam cleats are beneficial since they are easy to loosen once the victim is back on board your boat. Overboard! As with most crew overboard situations, a lifeline with a floating collar is dropped onto the water for the victim. This will enable us to pull the victim to the boat once the victim is able to place the flotation collar around themselves. With the lifeline secured to our victim, our next step is to set up the web drogue on deck and then connect it to a halyard. The halyard permits us to lower the drogue into the water. With the retrieval drogue ready to go, we pull the victim closer to the boat so the individual can swim to the drogue and climb into the basket. You might have to loosen the halyard just enough to permit the mouth of the drogue to sink slightly underwater. This makes it easier to slip into the basket. Try to avoid paying out too much halyard line or the drogue can sink too much and potentially snag on the boat's keel or rudder. The opposite end of the halyard is attached to a winch so we can winch in the victim. It took Bob a bit of strength and time to lift my 190 pound body from the water up to the deck of our boat. The web drogue does catch on the lifeline, so you might have to push the drogue away from the lines. The drogue also wraps around your body, similar to a fishing net, making it difficult to move your body and stop the drogue's tendency to spin. Having my feet fall through the openings of the webbing further reduced freedom of movement. Please keep in mind, our testing was designed to emulate a situation where you have one conscious victim in the water and only one rescuer aboard the boat, a common scenario for many cruising sailors. The drogue size we used was a 36 by 42 inch drogue. It was easy to slip inside the basket. I think anything smaller would have been challenging, especially in sloppy seas. Size becomes an issue when a rescuer must fit inside a drogue to pull an unconscious victim into the web basket and then both individuals must be lifted aboard the boat. This type of rescue would likely require an even larger web drogue than the 36 by 42 inches, obligating many sailors to own two drogues one for speed limiting purpose in storms, and one for MOB recovery. Something just not practical or cost effective. Second, even slight wave conditions can cause your body to slam against the hull of the boat. Two people inside a web drogue limits mobility for the rescuer inside the drogue. I'm not sure how you can avoid injuring the rescuer in rougher sea conditions, with the biggest concern associated with head injury. This feeling of being trapped inside a drogue is not the first time I've experienced this issue. Many volunteers, including myself, 
had the opportunity to use a variety of MOB recovery devices during a huge crew overboard symposium held in San Francisco Bay back in 2005. Several of the MOB devices were designed specifically to wrap around victims in the water. I became trapped in one of these MOB devices designed to lift an unconscious person from the water. The winch located on the mast of the sailboat had broken, causing most of the volunteers to focus on the defect, failing to notice how I couldn't move in the web device and that I was continually being dunked underwater. Fortunately, the weather was relatively calm with one sailor noticing my issue and making sure I was okay. With some effort, I was able to move my arm with my hand holding firmly to a rather expensive video camera. The sailor focusing on my predicament did reach down and grab my camera. Thinking back, it's kind of interesting how I was more worried about the camera than having to hold my breath every time I was dunked underwater. Eventually, I was lifted aboard the sailboat safely. Although I question the realistic benefit of placing a person inside a drogue, I can see its potential use for scooping up a small person or animal that's fallen into the water, especially one panicking. Such action could reduce injury to a rescuer who would otherwise jump into the water to save their pet. And the reality is, us pet owners love our pets and will be more worried about their well-being than our own. As with our previous crew overboard drills using drogues, as soon as our victim falls into the water, we toss a lifeline with a floating collar overboard and quickly turn the boat so we can return to our victim as soon as possible. With the collar secured around our victim, we then proceed to connect the halyard to the drogue. Although the supplier of the sea brake claims their device can be used as a spare man overboard device, there's no instruction provided on how this can be achieved. So we made the decision to connect the drogue to the halyard and then toss it to our victim. Like any fabric-based product we're supposed to slip into, I decided to use the openings on the drogue in an effort to hold on. Not only did it take a great deal of strength to avoid losing my grip, my hands were seldom available to reduce the pounding motion my body was receiving as it slammed against the hull of our sailboat. With minor wave action, holding onto the drogue and preventing injury would be next to impossible. Claiming this drogue can be used for crew overboard recovery with, or in this case without proper instruction, is completely irresponsible in my opinion. With this crew overboard exercise, no drugs will be used to assist with victim recovery. As normal, we drop a lifeline with flotation onto the water and turn our boat around as soon as possible, so our victim has the opportunity to grab the lifeline and attach themselves to the boat. With the victim safely secured to the lifeline, Bobbin snaps the slack and halyard and pulls down on the halyard in order to gather up extra loose line. This makes it easier for Bob to toss the halyard to the victim in the water. Snapping the halyard hook to the D-rings on the inflatable vest only took a few seconds. And from the moment Bob started to winch in the halyard line, the recovery process took just less than a minute. Compared to the other crew overboard recovery trials, the old-fashioned halyard method to lift the victim out of the water turned out to be the easiest to use, and by far the fastest. What I liked about this method was it gave me more control of my arms and legs. This is especially helpful if you want to reduce the impact of your body's tendency to slam against the boat's hull or its rigging, something guaranteed to be an issue in most circumstances. For the rescuer, there is little setup to worry about. A halyard is common in most sailboats and lifelines with flotation should be connected to the railing on the stern of your boat. With both items ready to go, there's less to think about when an emergency arises and there's less to go wrong. We tried a number of drogue uh, man overboard retrieval uh, setups today and by far the easiest was a uh, good old-fashioned uh, lifeline in the water, circling the individual and hauling them back up with a halyard. Um, what we found is that the drogues took a lot of setup and also a lot of uh, retrieval effort in some cases with a lot of uh, road in the water. And uh, I think that in rough seas and uh, open ocean conditions, the uh, uh, the lifeline and halyard uh, retrieval is, is by far the most realistic. Back in 2005, I was involved with the Crew Overboard Symposium, uh, along with many other professionals and, and volunteers. This was a huge man overboard event where we were trying out all kinds of different equipment and so forth. And I remember uh, being one of the victims in the water, and, and they had some kind of cargo net 
item for bringing people back on board wrapped around me, and the, the winch jammed on the people when they were trying to bring me back on board. And because of that, they were all focused on the damaged winch and forgot about me in the water. I was completely trapped. I couldn't, I couldn't move. And as the boat would heel over, I'd be dunked underwater. Now I'm a professional diver, so no big deal. I'm used to, you know, being pulled underwater with equipment and so forth. But that really resonated in my mind. And so today when we were uh, practicing our uh, man overboards using drogues for being part of the recovery system, that kind of resonated in my mind when I was, you know, inside the webbed gale rider, for example. That made me feel a bit uncomfortable. It was easy to climb into, but in the end, what ended up happening was once I was out of the water, I had that trap feeling I couldn't move very well uh, until it was actually brought, you know, on board. It felt very uncomfortable. And if you have an unconscious individual in the water, I think it would be very complicated to get that person inside uh, a, a drogue and then take the time to pull them uh, back on board. Maybe if you have a dog or a cat or small child and you want to scoop them up real quickly with that particular device, I think that's a, a nice concept. But overall, I, I think the fastest approach was simply you know, the old-fashioned throw the lifeline you know, in the water with uh, the buoy at the end of it. It was easy for me to climb into when I used my uh, legs to slip into it, uh, but one of the uh, occasions I had forgotten to do that and ended up trying to pull it over my head. Of course, now I have this big inflated vest and everything, and that took a little bit of effort to uh, get the sling you know, securely around myself. But once we approached the boat and someone hands me a halyard, it was so quickly uh, quick and easy to clip in. And I think a really important thing that was a nice reminder to me was the fact that we had uh, I had D-rings on my vest and I think that's really a good piece of equipment to have on your boat so you can use a Howard clip right onto the vest that's already inflated and now everybody can pull you on board. Now we only had my, uh, my, my sailing partner Bob who was at the helm doing all the work for the recovery for the most part. That was really tough for him because he was trying to keep the halyard from wrapping around shrouds and damaging the boat because this is just a practice, you know, we're not really actually trying to save someone's life in this particular situation. So it was really complicated for him to go ahead and pull someone up. It's, it's, it's nice to have another person manage the halyard while you're using a winch to bring in the, the person, but in real life there are a lot of just sailing couples out there, whether it's power or sail and that's all you have. So those are all things to consider. Uh, I, we actually inflated uh, one of the vests on shore because, you know, we kind of neglected not checking our CO2 cartridges, cartridges and, and, and the vest in, in general was old. I mean, it's probably about a 20-year-old vest, so I didn't know if it was going to break or not, so I inflated it while we're, we're here at the boat slip and then went out and, and tested it and everything worked really well. In fact, we actually had a lot of rust on our CO2 cartridge. So this is just a friendly reminder, you know, check your cartridges, make sure uh, everything's up to date. And I think that's about all I could really think of. Oh, one of the the drugs, the, the sea break, I was really disappointed that the fact that the manufacturers recommend that, rec recommending that as a potential uh, man over retrieval device. There is just no way. Even though I tried climbing into it, holding on, on to it, it took incredible strength to hold on to that drogue. And I even could hear some of the cracking from the thread uh, on there from my from my body weigh way about 190. So that should that, that, that just completely reckless to even recommend that to be used as a, as a man overboard uh, recovery device. Other than that, I think that's all I can uh, think of. Uh, oh yeah. When when I was being pulled on board, man, it hurts. It, your neck really gets jammed in all the different equipment that you're holding up, and you it, it can be a little bit of a workout. So I would recommend, even if you don't use drogues or parachute anchors, go out and practice uh, uh, crew overboard uh, recovery. It is a workout. We weren't able to do it inside the harbor like I wanted to, which would have been a lot more calm. We were outside the harbor, but we got lucky. This is Southern California. We do have a lot of beautiful weather. So the weather pattern, the ways and stuff were relatively calm for the most part. So hey, you guys uh, be safe and thank you very much for watching.